Hey everybody, Fred Minnick here, and in today's video, I'm going to talk about the Bottled and Bond Act, which was signed on this day in 1897, a long time ago. So important, you still see it on bottles today. You can go into a liquor store and they'll you'll see something like Old Forester 1897 Bottled and Bond. Uh, you'll see E.H. Taylor, well, you're probably not seeing this one on the liquor store, but you'll see E.H. Taylor, Bottled and Bond. More about E.H. Taylor and, and this dude coming up. Uh, but it's they're, they're growing. A few years ago, there was only like 15 of them, and most of them were owned by Heaven Hill, which shout out to my boy Bernie Lovers, who, in my opinion, is a big reason why Bottled and Bond has been making a comeback. One thing that's important to note for the modern sense is that it is very expensive to make bottled and bond whiskey. And a lot of the issues that we talk about with transparency, we want to know how the whiskey is made. We want to know um, where it came from. Bottled and bond solves so much. Now, what bottled and bond means today is, is, very, is a little different than what it used to mean. Uh, simply because so much in the law has changed. The tax stamps you can see here, like, you know, the tax stamps are, are no longer required. And so this is fanciful. And, you know, back in the day, they would have, like, distilled in the fall of 52, uh, bottled in the fall of 60. You know, I'm just using that eight-year mark as an example. But it basically means it has to be distilled at one distillery in one distilling season. So you can't, you essentially cannot batch uh, several distilling seasons together. So you can't batch something that was distilled in the spring of uh, 2015 with something that was distilled in the spring of, um, of uh, 2017. So you have to do it from like one, one season. So that's that in itself is is costly to both manage and to, you know, to limit what you can do. And I would think that a lot of the modern whiskey geeks would would love to see more bottled and bond because it would give you a chance to say, hey, man, what do you think about the spring of 2015 versus the spring of 2017? I think I like 16 better, but 15 and 17 are OK. <laughs> I don't know, I just made that up. But so that that's a very important aspect to it. Uh, it has to be 100 proof, but 100 proof always, and at least four years old. So it can be older than four years old, but it cannot be younger than four years old. So it has to be at least four years old. Now, I will have in the description the modern law as it is. So if you want to you know, take a deeper dive into that, uh, you will find it in the description. Now, Bottled and Bond was actually not called Bottled and Bond. It was called the Bottling of Distilled Spirits and Bond. You know, so that just didn't quite have the right, you know, tone to it or moniker to it. So they started calling it Bottled and Bond. And it it, it applied to all spirits, even vodka. Like if you look into the into the um, into the law of Bottled and Bond. You can uh, you can have a bottle of bond vodka. You have to put a paraffin wax inside the barrel, but you you can have it. But it applies to rum. It applies to brandy. Uh, it applies to so much. So you know it. But it, it, the focus is bourbon. And giving you an let me give you an idea of kind of where it came from. So so in the 1860s and 70s, the model of the whiskey business was a distillery would distill their whiskey, put it in a barrel, and sell it to a wholesaler or rectifier. There were a handful of distilleries that were actually bottling their own whiskey, but that was by far, you know, not, that was not normal. The normal practice of whiskey business back then was selling your barrels to a wholesaler or a rectifier. Those rectifiers would change the whiskey very often. Now, usually they were adding something like uh, prune juice. They would maybe throw in a little uh, sulfuric acid, but uh, to their knowledge, it was wasn't harmful for you know at that time. They were basically just trying to extend it, uh, and create more volume, so they could make more money out of it. And so 
the doctors would take the bottles. They would they would take the bottles from the rectifiers or the wholesalers, or the tavern or the store, whoever would have gotten the barrel from from the distiller, and they were noticing that their patients were not were not getting better. And so they're like, this whiskey, it's not it's not pure. It's not straight. And so they they took major issues with this rectified whiskey, as did the distillers. The distillers were like, why are you messing with our whiskey? Why are you messing with our whiskey? And they were also like concerned about all the taxes they were paying. And they were trying to extend the period at which they would have to pay taxes. And so there was all of this discussion coming in in the um, 1880s. In the 1880s, the distillers were beginning to fight and change some laws. At every turn, they lost. They were not, um, I shouldn't say at every turn, but for the most part, they were getting blocked by the liquor dealers. The liquor dealers, the equivalent of like the Wholesaler Association today, uh, was far more powerful, far more powerful than the distillers were. The distillers began to work together, and over time, they began to formulate uh, kind of an idea that they would work with Kentucky congressmen to introduce into the House. And that conversation started happening in the 1890s. In the 1890s, they began talking about what would become the Bottle and Bond Act. And it was really our country's first real discussion about a government guarantee on, on an alcohol. So there was all of this government guarantee conversation, but the people who were against it might actually surprise you. I.W. Bernheim, I, the guy you know, whose name is on this bottle, I.W. Bernheim, was very much opposed, very much opposed to the Bottle and the Bond Act because he had interests in Canadian whiskey. At the time, Canadian whiskey was beginning to enter the U.S. market, and it was doing really well. It was beginning to take market share from Kentucky distillers. And Bernheim and all kinds of people vehemently opposed it. And then the distillers were like, okay, you know what? If we don't, if we don't find a solution here where we can bottle our own whiskey and have some protection behind us, we're just not going to supply liquor dealers anymore. And so there was this big back and forth. Behind the scenes, you had E.H. Taylor, you know, spearheading distillers. You know, he was, he was kind of a, he, he was, a, he was a, a very, everything I've seen that describes E.H. Taylor was intense. Like he was a very intense individual. And he was passionate about, about bourbon. And he was on the losing side of, of some lawsuits from time to time. Don't get me wrong. He wasn't the best of business people. But he was so passionate about good bourbon and making sure that bourbon did not get confused for a blended whiskey or an imitation whiskey uh, or a rectified whiskey that he was among the many leaders uh, around the Bottled and Bond Act. And there were a, a lot of other champions, too. One of the other kind of unsung heroes, in my opinion, uh, uh, J.M. Atherton, who has a school named after him. He has a uh, town in Kentucky named after him. But he doesn't have a bourbon brand named after him, which I've always found a little, little, little weird. Um, anyway, but he was one of those people that was a, a big champion of Bottle and Bond, making sure that it got passed. Now, in my book... Uh, Bourbon, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Whiskey. I have the very first bottled and bond. Uh, the actual, this is the actual le legislation that was passed that Grover Cleveland signed. Beautiful, beautiful work right here. You take a look, see there? It says March 3rd, March 3rd, 1897. Now, this, uh, this this bill was an intended intended to stop counterfeiting intended intended to help uh, give uh, consumers a guarantee that the whiskey was was legit um, and it gave distillers you know it, it kind of gave distillers what what cognac has with like XO and um, you know it, it it was it was the stamp of quality for the most part. Like that was bottled and bond was the pinnacle of 
of American whiskey. It was ab- the absolute pinnacle. And to me, it should still be that, but let's be honest with you, we're, we're on a bit of a cash strength craze right now as a country. So 100 proof is, is like water to some people, which is, uh, is funny in some ways. Uh, but, uh, but Bottle in the Bond was absolutely uh, so important. Now, I want to kind of jump into a little bit into E.H. Taylor himself. Um, E.H. Taylor was a cattle farmer. He he ran uh, Hereford cattle. Was famous like he's uh, he was a famous um, you know rancher. He had he had like very famous Hereford bulls, which Herefords are the uh, the red bodied white faced ones. Very commonly get pink eye. By the way, um, I had to, I've had to take a few of those out of when I used to work for a veterinarian. Uh, anyway, don't you don't want to hear about that too much. Uh, he also was, uh, was raised by, by, um, uh, President, uh, Zachary Taylor. So like his, his father had passed and, you know, Zachary Taylor was his uncle. He was also a descendant of, uh, James Madison. So he was basically related to two presidents. And at this point in American history, you're, you're looking at, um, E.H. Taylor as being like, is this is this a person meant for political greatness? And the answer would somewhat be yes, but his main political play was not to run for office. It was the Bottle and Bond Act, so he would use his uh, political affiliations and connections to help kind of get this across the finish line. You find out about these people through, obviously, the distillers do a pretty good job of, of telling their unique history. Now, I always say that distillers are, are full of BS, but when it comes to the real history, they're usually they're usually pretty good about it. When they say something is the best or the first, I mean, I think you got to be careful what you listen to. But when it comes to the actual people, where they went to school, who they were related to, uh, that's usually pretty accurate. Um, and Buffalo Trace, uh, Sazerac, their parent company, Anytime they acquire a brand, they get they have a team that goes and tries to find as much history as they can about them. And so they came across some papers recently of E.H. Uh, e. Taylor and uh, his young lover, or whom we presume to be his young lover, which is um, Bernadette Kennedy. Bernadette Kennedy lived in Chicago, and he was writing her love letters uh, all throughout the early 1900s now if you're wondering e.h taylor was indeed married he was he was married his wife died in 1898 so this would have happened uh, when he was now a widow uh, but he was paying for this young woman's apartment paying for her college and um you know talking about meeting up here and there so what we know about E.H. Taylor, I think, is about to get a whole lot more interesting as uh, the Buffalo Trace crew uh, sorts through those letters and finds out more information. But I, I will say that that is how you find real history. Uh, in my career, having written seven books, you know, this, this book right here, this was... This was written through uh, reading old letters uh, from people like Creel Brown, going through treasury reports and stuff like that. You find you find more history in um, in letters and in archives and treasury testimony and lawsuits, things like that. And so I think we are about to have a big uncovering of of, of who E. H. Taylor was as a person. I know he was a cattle rancher. You know, I know he was. Uh, the descendant of two U.S. presidents. I know that he lost his shirt in some lawsuits, and you know, I know he didn't have the fondest feelings for his sons. So I know a lot about him as a man, but I think we're going to learn a little bit more. So the well, this is the this is the history of the Bottled and Bond Act. You know, you can't tell the history of these things without talking about the people who were a part of them. So stay tuned for hopefully more discoveries on uh, Colonel Taylor. Uh, and like I, th- I think I said it, or if I didn't, I was going to taste this, but I'm not in the mood to taste right now. 
And if you're wondering, like, what it what what causes me not to be in the mood? Well, basically, um, I have I have been working out really hard, and I'm exhausted right now. My palate's like when I'm exhausted, my palate sucks. So I do not want to be tasting. Um, at any rate, that's going to do it for me on this episode. Stay tuned, though, for me as I uh, taste the E.H. Uh, e. Taylor lineup in a, in a future episode. Uh, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, hit like, and tell your friends. I appreciate you uh, watching and listening, and be safe out there. Remember, vodka sucks unless it's being used for hand sanitizer. Cheers, y'all.